All right, so we talked about direction, size, color, and now we're gonna talk about readability of lighting, which is essentially two things, adequate light and object separation. So first of all, adequate lighting, it's a pretty simple concept to understand. Uh, it's just making sure that you've got the right amount of light. Most of us would agree that this doesn't have the correct amount of light. This is under lit. Um, and most of us would agree this is overlit. So the correct amount of light is somewhere in the middle there. Um, now this sounds like a very simple concept, but because everybody's monitor is a different brightness, um, it's often hard to know what the correct brightness actually is, which is why sometimes if you finish a render and it looks good and then you upload it to the internet and then look at it on your phone, it looks weird, it looks too dark or too bright. Um, it's just differences in display calibration. Um, you can get a spider, which will definitely help that. But when I go to the demonstration phase at the end of this video, I'll show you a tool in Blender that actually helps you visualize um, what the correct value should actually be so that there's less guesswork. Anyway, adequate lighting, pretty simple. Next up is object separation, which is what I'll spend the brunt of this video talking about. Object separation is essentially helping people see the, uh, the separation between objects as well as the background. In this example, it's pretty hard to know what we're actually looking at because we can see like one shape and then just sort of like some murky shapes in the background. Object separation is using light to essentially carve out the objects to separate them from each other. Um, which is sometimes called rim lighting. So it's uh, it's a very important concept, and uh, I think it's misused a lot of times. And some people have heard of rim lighting, but I think we've it's gone on long enough now that some of us are forgetting what rim lighting actually does. So um, let me give you some examples. So this is a painting um, from the 1800s, and it's pretty hard to tell um, where his head actually disappears. Oh, sorry, where his head stops and the background starts because they're sort of fused together. Kind of like, it could just be a giant tumor for all we know. Uh, we can't see it because there's no contrast to show that separation there. Contrast that with this, which obviously has uh, the sunlight coming from behind, which is acting as that very, very bright rim light. Rim light coming from the fact that it, it's like a rim around an object, right? Um, and by the way, I'm not discrediting this artist here. This was in the 1800s. Might not have even had an artificial light source he could have put behind him. Um, not to mention this concept is relatively new, I think, anyway. Um, but anyway, and there's also cases where you would actually want the one on the left, which we'll get to. Here's a, uh, an example from 3D rendering. Um, I love this image, beautiful, uh, of some Tasmanian tigers. And um, what, what's interesting is that you've got two tigers here feels weird calling them tigers. They look closer to dogs. <laughs> it's kind of like a stripy dingo. That's probably close. I, I feel like calling it tiger is a stretch. But anyway, you got these two tigers here, which they're right, right there, like right over the top of each other. And you've got a bunch of different legs and tails and heads and all that and stripes. Now, if this was an overcast scene, um, these would kind of fuse together and it would be very hard to read that you've actually got two tigers there. Um, you might think that it was just one that was fused together. But because of the rim light, the light coming from the back there, it is separating it from each other. Um, as well as the background, this uh, this log there. So that is where readability comes into place, helping people understand that. However, there is a downside to using uh, rim light like this, and that is that it can kind of look a little bit staged um, if you overuse it. Like in this scene from Black Panther, they you know disboarded this uh, spaceship and they walked out and they had a conversation and it was in the afternoon and everybody had perfect rim lighting. Everybody was just perfectly carved out from the background. Now this isn't impossible, right? Um, but it is improbable. This is the kind of shot that a photographer would wait for hours to get everything perfectly lined up and position the actors in just the right way so that everybody has this very clear outline separating them from the background. So yeah, it's possible, but it definitely looks staged. We know we're looking at a very carefully crafted Marvel movie um, and not something that was sort of shot on the fly, you know, in a realistic sort of look. Um, so lighting often has like a really, really big play into how real a movie can kind of feel. Um, for example, these are two shots from uh, Black Panther and Blade Runner, and they're almost of the exact same subject, a girl sitting in a spaceship. 
um, but both lit in a totally different way. Um, the one on the top there is a lot more readable, but you can feel it looks a little staged. It looks a little perfectly crafted. The one on the bottom here is less readable. Her hair is really disappearing into the background there. I don't know where her hair stops and the uh, spaceship or flying car, whatever you call that thing, starts um, somewhere in there, but it's less readable, but it feels more natural. It feels like something that you would see in your day-to-day -day life when you're looking behind you in the car and there's some, like, people aren't perfectly lit. That's just not how the world <laughs> works. Sometimes they are, but not usually. Um, so the one at the bottom there feels more realistic. There were scenes, by the way, in Blade Runner that definitely had, you know, Ryan Gosling's face carefully chiseled out of the background. <laughs> um, it's not like all the movie was like perfectly naturally shot, um, but it, it, in my opinion, that's part of the reason I think Blade Runner did feel more realistic is that the shots generally had a very natural, like less perfected kind of look. Um, and in fact, I think that the, the uh, director who does this the best is David Fincher. I don't know if David Fincher sets up his lighting or if he gets the, a DP to do it. But anyway, in this shot from Zodiac, um, you can see the character woke up in the middle of the night, turned on one uh, side bed lamp and answered the phone. Now his head is disappearing into the background there, right? Uh, but that makes sense for the shot. It wouldn't make sense for the director to go like, oh, well, hang on, Wait, his head's disappearing into there. We gotta put another uh, rim light on the on the right-hand side. No, like for the, for the point of this shot, for the story, it makes sense to only have one key light and for things to disappear. So you gotta think about what, what makes sense. It's not like you gotta always separate every single object because it just sort of feels fake and weird and like everything's perfectly um, cut out. And the other thing to consider is that you don't have to just use a rim light to separate an object because really you're looking for contrast. You're looking for differences in value. So you can see in this shot, they've got, it's a car shot, but the camera was positioned in such a way that you've got the back window there creating separation with uh, Daniel Craig. So there's no rim light needed. It still feels very real, but because of the background, um, you can still actually read the image fairly well. Okay, so here's our character from the start. I've just got one key light here, and uh, you can see it's pretty dark, right? So increase the value of the lamp. But where is the correct value? Because you can see at some point, we start to lose detail. Things get desaturated, which is what happens when light gets blown out. Um, and some of the detail in the highlights is starting to disappear. So there's somewhere around here is like the sweet spot, but what is that? Now, as I mentioned, everybody's monitor is different. Everybody's brightness on their, you know, everything is improperly calibrated. Um, you can get a spider, which will uh, actually uh, calibrate it for you, which will help. But still, it can be kind of like personal taste and like, what are you doing? You know, maybe you don't want to buy anything extra for the computer. So there's a tool in Blender which will actually help you uh, set this correct value. So if you go to the color management settings, by default, it will be set to filmic, which is what you want. Um, but you can preview exposure by using false color. And everything will look very psychedelic and acid trippy. But um, what it will show you is the exposure ranges of your um, of your objects. What 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 brightness you're essentially looking at. So the uh, obviously the black values. There's no data there at all. Then you got blue, then aqua, and then you got green, and then gray, and then green again. And gray is what you want. That is the middle exposure point. So now, if we look at our lamp here, you can see that if I increased this. You know, as things get really, really too bright, things get red and then finally white where you're losing um, information because it's too bright. So you really want to have it somewhere around about uh, sort of a gray value. I tried to go like just a little bit more than gray around about there. Um, and it looks a lot better. Now, um, I should say, by the way, just yesterday, I emailed Troy Sabotka who uh, created this filmic look and the false color. And uh, I told him that it's kind of confusing because you've got green on this side for like underexposed and then green 
on, as the next value that's overexposed. So I was like, what if you made those different colors and it would kind of be a bit readable? So uh, he's actually done that. And uh, this is what is gonna be in the next like official, maybe Blender 2.8 build. Um, it's gonna be pretty much the same. The gray value is gonna be a little bit tighter, but you've just got a uh, slightly bluer green and a yellower green to sort of signify that things are getting a little overexposed. But anyways, basic concept, pretty easy to, uh, to get. So uh, oh yeah, I should show you what it actually looks like. There we go. So this is the correct, correct value. Now, if this doesn't look right to you and you're like, oh, I don't know, I kind of wanted a little bit uh, a little bit more punchier. Like the problem is, is if you increase this, you're gonna start to lose de uh, saturation. So um, what I would suggest instead is right here where you got base contrast for filmic. By default it's set to none, but it's just base contrast. That's what it's using. Um, try high contrast and that'll sort of make things a little punchier. It'll uh, crush the midtones a little bit and you'll get a little bit more pop out of it. Um, that's a terrible way to phrase things, pop, but it's how it feels. It's just sort of popping out, popping out of there a little bit. Um, okay, so this is good, pretty boring, and we're losing a lot of detail. Not only on like his ear, we can't see any information there, right? Um, but also like back of his hair, and also this side of his face, right? So this is where we can talk about um, not rim light. We're not there yet. Let's talk about fill light. So I'm gonna duplicate this lamp here and I'm gonna position this just on the other side. Now the purpose of this light, and it's important to talk about the purpose of a light before you go dropping lights in. Um, the purpose of this light is to fill in some of those, um, some of those shadows, these dark values where you're losing information on the right side of him here. So I'm gonna make this a little low, just about there to sort of fill in maybe the bottom of his chin a little bit as well. And let's just increase this just a little bit like that. Okay, so just instead of it being total black, where there's no information whatsoever, it's just, uh, you know, it's not fading to total black. You've got just a little bit of information there. Um, and I also probably wanna make it, um, the size of this, make it a little bit bigger um, because it is a larger light, like it's filling in. And obviously as we spoke about with the size of the light, the larger the light, the more it's gonna sort of fill in those shadows. So I kind of want a bigger lamp, but that's, you know, that's basically all that needs to be. So it's called a fill light, right? Doesn't really matter what these names are, kick a light, fill light, whatever. like we're not working on a team of people. We need to go add a fill light, add the kick light, add, you know, it's just us. So it's, don't focus on the names of things. Um, think about what you're actually doing with, with that lamp before you add it. Okay, so now let's try to bring in some of his hair detail, which we are which we are currently losing, um, and maybe the the right of his ear there. So I'm going to duplicate my key lamp and I'm going to put it behind him, like so. Right now, if we put it right there, you can see very clearly it brings out that information. Now, obviously, how how hot you make this is uh, is really up to you, right? Like how how bright it is. There are scenes um, like from Casino where it's just like the rim lighting is so blown out, but it's a stylized look, right? Um, it's really up to you where you go with this. Um, that kind of looks okay to me. And it's very popular to use a different color for the background. And the reason for that is that I think, I mean, part of the reason like, you know, color, uh, complementary colors and all that kind of thing. But like you can see here by having this white light at the front and then also a white light at the back, it kind of, they can kind of get confused. Like it kind of looks like, like almost like a stripey pattern. Like you've got white, then shadow, then white. And they're kind of like, they just kind of get confused, right? Like where the light's coming from. So if you give it a color, like a really warm color like that, it's very clear that the light is, is, it's a separate light. And also it kind of expands the scene, like the, because uh, where is this light coming from? It could be from a fireplace. It could be from a street light, as we talked about. Um, now it's got a little bit of an intrigue, a little bit of uh, environment, even though we haven't modeled any environment, right? Um, and if you want to, and this is totally optional, but you can have another one on the left-hand side. Um, I don't know what you call it, kicker light, something like that. You can have that if, if you were so inclined and you could give it a bluer color to give that complimentary sort of look if you wanted to. Um, and obviously the uh, the bigger the light source, the more it's gonna sort of fill in and sort of wrap around your character. Um, whereas the smaller the light source, the more punchier it's gonna be. Like it's like one little bright highlight on his cheek there. Um, you get the idea. So you can play around with those values, but that is essentially it. So this is, more readable, right? It's more readable than it was previously. Um, and 
this isn't like, oh, this is the one standard way that you should light something. No, there's not one standard way to do anything. Um, you'll find examples of things that have no rim lights and they look amazing and ones that have lots of rim lights and they also look amazing um, and vice versa. Things that look terrible even though they have the exact same lighting as something that looks great. Um, it depends on the situation and what you are trying to say with it. So that's readability. Very simple. Make sure you got just the right amount of lighting using that false color system. And then whether or not you want to have rim lights and separate something really depends on what you're going for. So that is part four, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give it a thumbs up. And in the next part, we're going to talk about emphasis, getting into composition, uh, inverse fall off, and all that good stuff. So go ahead, click there on the screen, and I will see you in that video.